So we're going to start out with uh, who God is. This is not a full study because we actually do have an evening school of the Bible class that relates to who God is and goes in great detail. So it's going to be kind of a little bit of a summary of that, but it is something that's very important for us as Christians to understand. Make sure that our understanding of God aligns with Scripture, because a lot of times we pick up some things from different areas, and we don't always verify them. Or maybe we just perceived it in a slightly different way and didn't understand it. So this would be one of the areas that we want to go into Scripture, and we want to look at what Scripture actually says about God, and make sure that we are aligning our, our thinking with what Scripture actually says. You know, kind of one of those examples of when we're putting things to the test to see what quality is. Am I clear in my mind on who God actually is? Because a lot of times we'll think, well, yeah, I am, but are you actually clear on it? So well, it's always good to actually re be reminded of it. So the Bible actually reveals a divine being who is unique from all other beings. And what I mean by that is there is no other God. There has never been another God. There will never be another God. He is a very unique being. Okay. And he actually reveals himself to us in Scripture so we can understand him. He exists in three distinct persons, yet one essence. Now, most of the time, we as, as Christians understand that concept, the Trinity. God is three in one. You know, even though it can take a little bit to really fully perceive that, because right now, God is presenting himself in, in three different ways. And what I mean by that is each person is representing an aspect of deity. God the Father is representing the fact that God is the source of all things. God the Son, he is the one who is the Word. He puts it into action. He is the one who makes God in a visible way for us to see him. He actually wrapped himself in flesh so we can see him. And then we have the Holy Spirit, who always represents deity as spirit. So we don't see the spirit, but um, especially for Christians, the spirit influences us through our desires. We'll actually talk about that in more detail with the Christian life, too, because it's important. He previously, he would influence people through uh, visions and dreams. God even spoke to people. And by the way, when God spoke to people, which person of the Godhead was that? It was the one who manifests God in a way that we as humans can understand. It's God the Son. You know, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, when we actually study out the angel of the Lord, um, which, interestingly enough, it actually has an article, the angel of the Lord is God the Son. Okay, So he's manifesting himself in a way, he's manifesting deity in a way we can actually understand it as humans. Uh, the Holy Spirit, by the way, he doesn't need signs, wonders, and other things like that for us today. What is the big difference between today in how we relate to God and 2,000 years ago before Christ actually came? What's the big difference? I don't remember what passage this is. Yes, that's one thing. But something changed. So it's John, it's around 16 or 17 where he talks about this. Um, he talks about the, uh, oh, it's 14. Yeah, so John chapter 14 and verse 17. Now in the context in John chapter 14, um, and as a matter of fact, it, it, when you understand where scripture splits, John chapter 13 begins what we would refer to as the New Testament. Now, most of the time we think of, oh, the New Testament actually starts in Matthew. Now, why do we put it in Matthew? Because that's where we transition from Hebrew to Greek. But was Jesus actually born under the New Covenant? He wasn't. He was born under the law. So all of the time that Jesus was ministering, it was under the law. Now, if it's under the law, it's not for us as Christians. Because we're not under law. We keep that in mind. So up till John chapter 13, 
the predominant focus, and I'm not saying there isn't some bits and pieces for Christians, but the predominant focus is Old Testament and Israel. Okay? And Jesus does actually even talk about some things in the millennial kingdom, but that's again, that's focus on Israel. He reveals some information about the church, but it's minimal, and we'll see that. So, so when you're reading, a good example of this is reading Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. We do not apply that to Christians. Why? Millennial. Not just millennial, but Christians don't even exist at this point. Okay. There's, no, there's not even a thought that Christians will exist at this point. He's coming to Israel as the Messiah. He's speaking to Israel. Don't take something God's saying to one person and try to apply it to yourself. That's not the way Scripture actually works. So, but in John chapter 13, what is about to happen? We're on the night in which he was betrayed. Judas has left. He is only talking to the remaining 11. All of the information he's going to give to the, to the 11, he does say, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to remind you of what I'm saying. Because I'm giving you, I know I'm giving you too much detail. Kind of like Greek class. Give you way too much detail to learn. But we'll come back and we'll be reminded of it. You know, that's what he's doing in John chapter 13, kind of on. And then, of course, we have the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. Now, after the resurrection of Christ, we have the new covenant. Once he was resurrected from the dead. So here is one of the areas in, in there that he shows us that there's going to be a change in the relationship with humans and God. So in John chapter 14, verse 7, it says, The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, he dwells with you. And this word with you literally means alongside you. But he will dwell in you. Now, is there a difference between alongside and in? There's a big difference. Okay. So the Holy Spirit actually indwells a believer. What does that mean? That means in our spirit, which is the part of us that's actually saved. Remember, our spirit is our rational part. God, the Holy Spirit, actually dwells in there. So how is God going to communicate with us today then? Does he need to speak to us? He doesn't. As a matter of fact, if God came down here and sat with us and spoke to us, you know that would not be as effective as the way he communicates with us now today? Because he communicates us through our desires. When we actually have desires to do what is good, to do what is right, those come from God, and we should pay attention to them. Okay. And Scripture does actually, uh, it talks about this. This is over in uh, Galatians 5, if I recall, um, where he's talking about dealing with the sin nature, because in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, he says, I say then, walk, and of course your word walk here literally means to govern the manner of your life by the Spirit. And you will not fulfill, that is, this word fill, fulfill here means, it's teleos, it's a Greek word teleos, which means bringing to its intended end. You will not fulfill the strong desires of the flesh. But the flesh, now I know it's using the word lust, but again, this is one of those areas where knowing the Greek actually helps a little bit. Because this word is epithumia, which means a strong desire. Not necessarily a bad desire in the sense that oftentimes when we think of lust, what do we, we put lust in a specific category. Do we put all bad desires in the category of lust? We actually don't. Okay, typically, a lot of times, lust, we relate to sexual things. There is some areas where it comes out of that, but most of the time it's related to sexual things. But the desires from the flesh are far more than just sexual things. So this actually isn't very fair to us in our understanding to translate it as lust, because immediately we take it to a certain direction. It just means a strong desire. The flesh has strong desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. 
so that we do not do the things that we actually desire. And the things that we desire here is the things related to the flesh in the context here. So you see, God right now, he actually, because he indwells us, he relates to us in a completely different way than he did Old Testament saints. Which would also mean that if you're trying to apply Old Testament doctrine, that's not going to work because that's not the way God relates to you. you know, we don't want God, we want to relate to him properly. So that would be God, the Holy Spirit. That's how he relates to us. So all three persons have always been and always will be fully God. God has never existed outside of being three persons ever you know and that's very important um therefore three gods do not exist there's only one god however this one divine being possesses three distinct individualities there is no other being like him in this matter there's no way really truly in our concept here in this world to try to comprehend this in a way, well, we, we fall short. I've heard examples of uh, water. Water being an example of the Trinity. Why would water be an example of the Trinity? Well, it has three different forms it can be in. Okay, so steam, actual liquid, and then a solid. Okay, but that actually falls short of the actual Trinity because it is not one God acting in three different ways, it's three gods. So any one of the persons of the Godhead could be, in this analogy, for as bad as it is, could be steam at any time, could be solid at any time. It does. It falls apart very quickly. I've also heard the concept of an egg being used, the outer shell, the uh, inner, and then, of course, the yolk. But the problem with that is uh, the, an egg each of those parts do not, at any given time, possess the entire egg. And what I mean by that is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all possess the entire aspect of deity. There is no limitation. They're not three little bubbles inside of the big bubble, shall we say. It doesn't work that way. So we need to be cautious with that. One being three distinct persons. Um, now, let's see. To assist us with understanding who he is, he reveals to us, like I said, these persons in distinct ways. Uh, the person revealed as God the Father shows that God is the source of all things. And that's really what the concept of Father means. When you go back and you understand that from Scripture, um, when we say somebody is the father of something, we mean they're the source of it. We actually use that today, don't we? The father of science, the father of math. We actually use it. So we're saying the person who's the source of that particular uh, method. So he's displaying God as the source of all things. The person displayed as God the Son exhibits God in a human form through which we can discern his character. The, the person manifested as God the Spirit presents the essence of God, for God is spirit, and he always will be spirit. He is never anything but spirit. And we need to understand what spirit actually is. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. These three individuals are not one God displaying himself in three ways. This is actually important, by the way, because there's some people who want to come and say, well, it's really God acting in three different ways. So it's a single person, but he's acting like the Father here, and he's acting like the Son here. And he's acting like the Holy Spirit here. That falls apart actually rather quickly in Scripture. Uh, especially when you get to passages where God the Son, who's here on earth, is talking to God the Father, who is in the heavens. He's not talking to himself. He's talking to an actual person. But they're both God. Mm -hmm. The three individuals are not one God displaying himself in many ways. Instead, they manifest the three unique personalities of God. Therefore, God the Father never acts as though he's God the Son, nor does the Spirit himself act in any way as though he is any of the other members. As a matter of fact, what they typically do is like with the Holy Spirit, he is indwelling us. 
But what is his focus on in teaching us? It's how to dwell in Christ. So he's focused on the second person of the Godhead and, and us understanding how to, to actually have him manifest his character through us. That's his focus. Okay. But he's still an individual person. And that's important to understand. Now, I didn't actually use the actual terminology in there because we use that in uh, in in the actual course for this because there's different um, theological words for this that people actually use. You know, but we do want to understand God is actually one one being, one one in essence, three in persons, three distinct persons. Within Scripture, God reveals to us his nature, which is a combination of your essence and your attributes. Now, nature is something that all beings have. Uh, we as humans have a nature. Our nature is three parts. We have a body, soul, and spirit. Um, God is one part. He is spirit. That is his actual essence. So, But along with the essence, what you're made up of, you have natural inherent abilities from that essence. And now the combination of those two would make up your nature. And God actually reveals these things. The essence is the essential or basic structure of an entity. It describes what something is made up of, the underlying substance. Therefore, essence is the basis by which something exists. It describes the footing of justification for boasting, Reason for steadfastness, the foundation of hope, and the underpinning of the inherent ability of a being. No, that was a lot. But what it does, this is a very interesting about this word, um, which technically is a Greek word, hypostasis, which uh, let's, let's go over to Hebrews chapter 1, where it actually uses this word, because here it's using it with uh, talking about Christ, and it says here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the the express character of his person, but this is actually not your word person. This is hypostasis. This is essence of his actual essence. Okay. Well, we see this word used in a lot of different areas. Actually, let me get it to go look up this word for me. Really? Apparently, we're not going to go look up that word. And do it over here. There we go. Hypostasis. Okay, so typically in, in some of our translations, we'll actually, they'll translate it as confidence. But the confidence literally means the basis for which something exists. Why it exists. So we see an example of this over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 4 says, least if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be, saying, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. So what it's saying is on the basis of why you're boasting, and what they're talking about is we're going to give some money to help those in Jerusalem. And he's saying, you guys need to start setting some money apart now so that when we come, you're not put to shame because you're boasting about this. You're boasting on the grounds of we're setting aside some money to actually help the saints in, in Jerusalem. So that's what he's talking. It's the same word, hypostasis. It's the actual reason the boasting exists. Because if they weren't doing this, there would be no there would be no reason for boasting about it. So that's what it's kind of, uh, this is how this word is generally used, um, which is kind of interesting. So, like I said, in the second letter here, Paul actually does this. Um, he's encouraging them to be uh, to set aside fund funds to fulfill their commitment, at least when he comes, some of the Macedonians who come with him. And by the way, the Macedonians were the first ones who actually gave. They were poorer than the saints in uh, Corinth, by, by substantially poorer. But they gave a lot of money, and they didn't give to boast. Okay, they gave because they wanted to partake and take care of the saints that were in Jerusalem that were having a difficult time. Okay, they gave out of their poverty. God gave them a little bit. They said, hey, we got plenty. Paul, by the way, refused to take that money. And they said, no, 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 <laughs> you're not refusing it. And, and he understood, no, you guys actually are doing it right. 
this will lead me into what I talk to a lot about is when it comes to giving in the church, it is very important to understand how we give. We're not under law. So if we're not under law, are we under a tithe? Tithe relates to the law. Okay. We do not tithe. As a matter of fact, if you really understand what a tithe is, a tithe cannot be given properly in the church. Because how do we give properly? Free will. God loves a cheerful giver. If I'm giving a tithe, I'm not necessarily cheerful about that. Because technically, tithe is a tax. And I don't know anybody who's ever been cheerful about paying a tax. Okay. And yes, it is actually technically substantially more than 10% if you really understand it under the law. Uh, but the Macedonian saints gave this. And the Corinthian saints are like, yeah, we'll support it. But the Corinthian saints were, were much, they were a very wealthy church, actually. And he's saying, you all better start preparing this because you're boasting about this. And if I bring one of these Macedonian saints with me, he's going to put you to shame if he finds that your coffer is empty and you haven't been preparing at all, but you've been boasting about this. Upostasis. That's the grounds by which they were actually boasting about this. Very interesting. Uh, we also see an example of this here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse uh, 2 Corinthians 2. 17 yeah there's why did that take me to 11 17 yeah it, it actually will go over to this one because i think did i actually put it wrong in my notes yeah gotta correct that in my notes shouldn't be 217 it should be 11 17 so 11 17 uh, this is where Paul, he is uh, on the foundation of foolishness. Paul is going to boast. And he's going to boast because there's some false apostles that have come into to Corinth. And they're claiming that Paul is just a weakling. You know, he he's strong in word, but he's weak in faith. And he's not really the apostle. We're the super apostles. They actually use the word super. We're the super apostles. Okay. Paul's nothing, but he talks about, you know, okay, I'll boast. But his boast here, the word confidence, is foolishness. It's based upon foolishness because he's saying it is absolutely foolish for me to boast on in relation to the flesh. But if you want to boast according to the flesh, who actually had a boast? Of all the Christians, Paul was the one who had a boast. He not only had a boast in the Jewish um, area, because he was born of the right tribe. He was the one who grew up to at the feet of Gamaliel to be the teacher of Israel. He was a very intelligent man. He was circumcised the proper, properly. He followed the law to the letter. But he understood, no, that's completely ridiculous. But here, of course, they're saying, well... These apostles, they're better than than uh, than Paul was. So he says, "Well, on the basis of foolishness, I'm gonna I'm gonna boast." But is but it's foolishness to him. Then we also have a very interesting passage where we have a definition of faith. Did you know that Scripture actually defines faith for us? Because oftentimes, what we see today, oftentimes what I run into today. In, in people that are teaching, they teach faith as really presumption. Well, you just don't have enough faith. Well, what does faith actually mean? Faith means to trust in somebody, is typically what we'll say. But we don't want to use faith in a way where we're using an equivalent with hope. And what I mean by that is, well, I hope this person will actually do what they say they'll do. That's not really what faith is. Um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance. This is your word, hypostasis. So substance, not a bad translation and understanding. It's what underpins. It is what is the basis for that which is hoped for. 
Um, <clears throat> now, in our interlinear here, and it actually might pay because you got that book in front of you that's uh, that actually has the uh, Greek in it. So the interlinear that's uh, on all of your desks, if you go over to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it might help to pay attention there because my software kind of moves some words around and it can be a little confusing. Um, because in here, you can actually see it kind of lined out a little bit better where the Greek is actually at. So this is over in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 where you see this. And we're actually going to look at the uh, what's in the actual Greek part of it, not the translation part of it, because they do a really good job here with under underneath the where it should be. So in the order of the Greek, it's going to say it is now faith. So that is now faith is. And then it, it translates it of things being hoped for or that which is hoped for. So you'll see here in our in our English translation, it says things that are hoped for, but you'll notice this first word things isn't actually things in general. It's that which is hoped for. So it's based upon hope. It is the substance of what is hoped for. Hope is always based upon a promise. And then, of course, it has your word hypostasis there, assurance. And then it goes on, of things, of pragma, of accomplished deeds, it is proof. Not of being seen. Okay, so not things that are actually seen. Now, I know that's a little weird in English or in, in the Greek, but let's put it in the proper order for, uh, it, for English here. It says, now faith is the substance of that which is hoped for, the evidence of the evidence of things not seen. Actually, it says the evidence of that which is not seen. And this word seen is blepo, which means you can't look at it, can't view it. I can't look at you and see that you are fully glorified in Christ yet. Even though technically in Christ's mind, you are, uh, and actually in God's mind, you are fully glorified already. But I can't see that yet because the promise hasn't been completely fulfilled yet but it's still there. Now, I should, because God actually made a promise that he'll save us, I should treat everybody as though they're saved. I should act as though I'm saved because I am, in God's mind, already saved. That's hope. What's my hope? You know, God told me that if I believed that Christ died for my sins, was buried and rose again on the third day, I would actually be saved. And, and at that moment, and in the Christian life, we'll kind of go into details with this. At that moment, when I believed that, I became alive to God in my spirit. But did anything change in my flesh? It hasn't changed yet. But I have a promise, don't I? What is our promise? We're going to be like him in his resurrection. We're going to be resurrected. So I have a hope. And that should impact my actual um well, my conduct. So therefore, faith is something that is always based upon hope. Hope is always based upon what? Promise. Always based upon a promise. So if you find that your faith is failing, maybe you need to go back and look at what are you actually pinning that faith on? Because it might be of something that isn't a promise to you. Okay. Might be a promise for Israel, but not for you. So this is faith. This is the under. This is what actually is the basis for the existence of faith or, or hope. Faith is the actual um, underpinning for hope. The character and person of Christ fully represents the essence of God to us in human form, and we saw that. And we'll go back over there into Hebrews chapter. Uh, let me get Hupostasis back up here. Uh, Hebrews, no, this is not picking my words very well today. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. 
which we were just over there a little bit, but we'll go back through it real quick. And it says, uh, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image, your word express image here, by the way, uh, actually, it's it's kind of interesting because if you pronounce the Greek word, you can actually understand what the word means. If you pronounce it, it actually is character. It's actually how you would pronounce the Greek word. And that's, by the way, what it means. Or another way of saying that is if God the Father came himself, he wouldn't have acted any differently than God the Son did because God the Son was a full representation of deity. The exact character of his hypostasis, not his person, of his essence, of the essence of God. So, yeah, we have the full essence of God manifested in Jesus Christ. That's what it's specifically saying there. So, the second person of the Godhead in human form, he is the radiant of a proper opinion and character of the essence of God. He has always ex existed as God with the other members of the Godhead. Therefore, he is not a created or birthed being. Now, this is over in John chapter 1 and verse 1. We were over there a little bit earlier. And this, again, is a very powerful verse when you really begin to understand it in the Greek. But in the English, it still does a really good job. I mean, it's actually a pretty good translation in the Greek or from the Greek. There are some nuances it loses just because you have to use some, just some additional words to kind of explain some things in Greek. But we get the general concept. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and or was with God, and the word was God. He is deity. This is God the Son, the second person of the Godhead. He set aside his outward appearance of God, and he took on the appearance of a man and was found in the likeness of a man. Now, this is over in Philippians. Let's head over into Philippians chapter 2. And starting in verse 8 here, it says, well, actually, I could back up just a little bit in the context of what he's talking about here, because in starting in verse 5 is where he really begins the context here. So this is over in Philippians chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 5. That'll be our, our best area there. So Philippians, yeah, let's head over there, Philippians chapter and verse 5. And here it says, let this mind, this frame of mind, be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form, your word form is morph, the outward form of deity. It actually says he was in the outward form of deity. Did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Because he is God. So having a manifestation of deity was not something he considered that he stole. He didn't steal it. It belonged to him. But being in the outward form, he made himself of no reputation, taking on the morph, the outward form of a bondservant. And coming in the likeness of a man, having a similarity to us as humans. And being found in the appearance, this word appearance means schema. Uh, actually, this word schema literally means to put on a mask. So what it is saying is he masked the manifestation of his deity so that we could actually see him as a person, as a human. Because if he didn't mask that, that manifestation of deity, we couldn't see him. We have one person who wanted to see God. You remember Moses? He was asking, I want to see you. What did God do? He put him into a cliff, and he covered his hand, and he passed, and he barely saw a glimpse of God, and he couldn't handle that. So we couldn't handle it as humans, not in the state we are now. When we're resurrected, we're going to see God in a way that, oh, it's absolutely incredible. But so he was found in the appearance of man, humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. He actually was God. He is God. Not so much was, but he literally is God. But he wrapped himself in a way that we could understand. Over in John chapter 4 and verse 24, it talks about God's essence. So 
So this is John chapter 4 and verse 24. Here it says, God is spirit. Um, now, again, this would be another way of expressing essence. And, and the way that the Greek would express this is God is as to quality and character spirit. It is not saying God the spirit is God. It's saying God, deity, is actually his underlying essence is spirit. That's what he's made up of. Uh, spirit, the underlying immaterial substance that is the basis for God is spirit. And spirit is characterized as self-existing, um, simplicity, immense immensity, and unity. And we'll kind of look at all of those. So you have... This is how the essence of God is actually expressed. It is self-existent. God actually has life within himself. He does not need anything else to maintain his life source. Nothing impacts his life source. He actually has life within himself. He is simple. And what I mean by that is he is not a complex being. He is simply made up of spirit. That's all. You know, there's no other parts to him. He is immense. When we look at that, we're going to see that God actually um, goes beyond the created universe. His essence is far beyond the created universe. And he is also um, united or in unity. There is one God. There isn't three gods. Self-existence is an inherent characteristic of spirit. The animating principle of spirit has no beginning and no end. Therefore, God possesses life within himself. Now, we see that over in John chapter 5 as an example of that. John chapter 5 and verse 26. In John 5, 26, it says, For as a father has life in himself, so he has granted the son to have life in himself. Now, of course, in this context, Jesus is talking about in his humanity, not in his deity. Okay. But you can see the Father has life within himself. He actually, his essence maintains its own life source. Now, for us as humans, is that true? What do we as humans have to do to maintain our life? We need something exterior, don't we? We got to eat. We got to breathe. You know, other things like that. We need something to sustain our life. God does actually, he doesn't need that. He has the life within himself. The basis of his existence is uh, by the necessity of his own being. Okay. And he is the only living and true God. We actually see that reference specifically over in First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9. Or here it says, they themselves declared concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He is a living and true God. All other idols, by the way, are sticks and stones. That's all they are. Just sticks and stones. And it's amazing that people will bow down to sticks and stones, but not the true one. He is the I am. Over in Exodus chapter 3. And verse 14, he actually uses the, the Hebrew word here over in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14 and literally says, I, on my part, I am. That's actually who he says. He says, I am. I am the I am. I exist. I am the existing one. You know, actually, the word uh, we typically translate it as Jehovah, or have you heard it uh, pronounced as Yahweh? If you actually pronounce it correctly, it's Yahweh, or something along those lines. Uh, now, granted, I'm, I'm probably pronouncing Hebrew with an accent, but it's something along those lines. It's not actually not Yahweh. Yahweh in Hebrew actually means the self-existing one. That's actually what his name means. It's quite interesting. So by his name, he tells us he is self-existing. And actually, I put that in, I put that in the notes too. Um, Yahweh actually, or Yahweh, 
comes from uh, the root of it is to be actually with the root of that of his name i am to be that relates to his his self-existence so he is self-existent his essence is self-existent it will always be it needs nothing to uh exist outside of who he is unity then relates to his essence so when we talk about his unity we're talking about his essence not the individual persons of the Godhead, because they are distinct. But we're talking about his actual essence. God's essence is singular in essence. Therefore, he is one spirit. The persons do not divide or separate the essence in three individual beings. So it's not three gods with the same essence in the sense of all of them are individuals. It's one essence. All three possess the one essence. They're all within that one essence. So they don't divide that up among themselves. Uh, since spirit is united, it cannot be added to or taken from. Instead, it is always singular and always will remain one essence. That's actually why it's important to understand when we're talking about God being uh, in unity, we're talking about his essence, and God's essence can never change. It can never be added to, it can never be taken away from. Or another way of saying this is God will always be God. And he kind of expresses that in a few different ways. He will always be God. There is one God. Uh, this is something, by the way, that I know that oftentimes the Jews get hung up with because they really don't pay attention to their own scriptures, um, where they'll say, well, God is one God, so therefore Jesus can't be God. But do you know that in the Old Testament, God still revealed himself as three persons? Three distinct persons are, are actually clearly defined in the Old Testament. And if Israel was paying attention, and some Israelites did understand it, but most of them think, oh, no, he's just one singular God, one singular person. They didn't understand the distinctions. Uh, God states this to Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the God is one. By the way, your word Lord here is Yahweh. Because there's a couple of different uh, Hebrew words for Lord, and this is God's name. So he's, when it says, hear, O Israel, your Lord, he's saying, Yahweh, the God, the one living God, he is one, he is singular. The essence of the Father and the Son is one thing. And we actually see Jesus reference this over in John. Uh, John chapter 10 and verse 30. He says here, I and the Father are one. Now, again, this is one of those areas where it really helps to have a little bit of a concept of the Greek. Because when you get into this word one, the way that the Greek can express things is it doesn't need an additional adjective. And what I mean by that is in English, what would we actually add to this? We would say one thing. We need a one what? Greek doesn't need it. Greek has it inherent. But we need to translate that out in order for us to actually understand it. So in the original, it says, I and the Father are one thing. He's talking about their essence. They're one being, singular. They're not individual beings. Uh, by the way, this concept um, is also used in similarity with uh, the church, because we are all part of one body. We're all part of the same body. We don't have different bodies in the church. We're all part of the singular church. So he uses it in the same way. It is important to note that when Jesus states that this, he's using a neuter uh, gender for the uh, word. Uh, oh, this is one of the funny things, and I've run into this in trouble. You know, it's like uh, the concept of gender that they're trying to push today. Gender relates to language. It does not relate to humans. It, it always relates to, you know, they want to say, what gender are you? That is so improper. It's what sex are you? <laughs> you never say gender. Gender is literally a word for language. 
and we have three different genders. You have masculine, feminine, and neuter. They have nothing to do with sex. It has to do with the classification of different words and how they're used. You know, do I refer to this in a, in a male sense or a female sense or just a general sense? Thanks. So when I use the word gender, I am actually referring to the grammatical term for gender, which means it's just, it's a general thing. We are one quality of thing. Um, it's it's not masculine. It's not feminine. He's, so if it was masculine, by the, by the way, it would indicate that he is the father, but he's not. He is one thing. You know, even the demons know that God is one, but they also know each individual member of the Godhead. Remember the demons in the, the uh, was, was it the Legion? Yeah, it was Legion. When Jesus came up to Legion and, and the Legion says, what do you have to do with us now? Uh, it's a little early for you to throw us into the abyss. And they wanted to go into the swine. What did they say? They knew who he was. They knew he was God. The, the demons actually know. But they also know that there are not three gods. There is one individual God. James chapter 2 and verse 19 talks about that. <laughs> you believe there is one God you do well. Even the demons believe that and tremble. And, and actually in the context here, because he says, oh, foolish man, because at least the demons are smart enough to tremble at the fact that they understand that. Sometimes humans aren't that smart. You know, we, we don't pay attention to facts. The simplicity of the essence of God means that the spirit can never become anything but spirit. It's simple. It always will be simple. It's just, it's just spirit. His essence cannot be compounded with another substance by adding to it or dis, uh, disarranging by decomposing. Yeah, God does not actually corrupt. He does not become old. He is the ancient of days, but he is not old. He's not any older than the day in which he, well, there was no day in which he ever became into existence. He's always been into existence. And I know that's a difficult thing for us as humans to understand because we have a beginning. Everything we know has a beginning. God never had a beginning. He always has been. Always will be. His essence is and always will be simply spirit. Therefore, when he's called king of kings or king of the ages, incorruptible, invisible, it is true because his essence does not change or corrupt. Uh, and this is over, by the way, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17, where it actually references this. Uh, I got it in your notes, too. Now to the king of, of the ages, incorruptible, invisible, only God. Wisdom and glory into the ages of the ages. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17. Professing themselves to be wise, they were made to be foolish and changed the proper opinion of the incorruptible God into the likeness of corruptible humans and birds and four-footed uh, animals and creeping things. Romans chapter 1 verses 22 through 23. This is why we have people who change God's uh, who God is to that of humans. It's a corruption, as though God is a human, as though God is a man. But God is not a man. He is not like us. Now, when it comes to immensity, because his essence is actually immense, immensity describes his essence. His essence is beyond the boundaries of this universe. And we see that over in 1 Kings as one of the examples. Uh, 1 Kings and chapter 8 and verse 27. Here it says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heavens and the heavens of the heavens cannot contain you, how much less the temple which I built. Now, if the heavens of the heavens cannot contain him, that means he is outside the heavens. Um, I don't think I went into this in this particular one. I might have. Did I actually go into this? Um, I, yeah, I kind of do on my notes here because this is very interesting when you understand. Um, I didn't go into it with the fall of Satan 
uh, which uh, I suppose we'll get into that a little bit later because when we start talking about Satan, I want to talk about who he actually is. He is not a little red-headed demon running around with horns and a pitchfork. He is not in hell. He's not after everybody's soul to take them to hell. That is all fictitious, made-up stuff to scare people. Okay. He is not actually an angel. We, we tip and oftentimes say he's an angel, but he's not. He's a cherub. And we want to understand that. A little bit different. But when Satan attempted to... Well, when Satan sinned, what he sinned, what he was attempting to do was set his throne up in the third heaven with God's throne, and he wanted to do a sin above the clouds of the third heaven. Well, above the clouds of the third heaven is outside the universe. Christ did this in his resurrection. He, and in his human body, in his resurrection, he actually ascended above and through the heavens, all the way through. And why did he do that? Doesn't mean anything to us, but who does it mean something to? Spirit beings. Spirit beings looked at him and said, "No, you're 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 a human." And he said, "No, I'm God. Let me show you." And he went above into an area where nobody could go, except God. God actually did this, and we had, we do have this. I think I have it over in uh, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter four and verse fourteen. Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Now, if you've passed through the heavens, that means you didn't stop in the heavens. He went all the way through. So he is actually God in the flesh. And that's important to understand. Because he is immense, he can be er everywhere all the time. Heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. Christ showed the immensity of God, like I said, by ascending above the heavens where God himself is the only one that can go. Uh, the ability of Christ to pass through the, the heavens actually shows that he is God. That is, just because he wrapped himself in flesh didn't decrease who he actually is. He still is God. He's just now wrapped in flesh. This aspect of God's nature is fully manifested to us through Scripture. Uh, he has set his glory above the heavens. He is high above all the nations, and the proper opinion of who he is is above the heavens. I use the word, by the way, I, I've used this a couple of times. I've referenced it a couple of times. I'll use the word proper opinion. I want to explain that. Let's go over to Psalms. I do believe that has one. Psalms chapter 113 and verse 4. Yeah, this is your word glory. Your word glory in the Greek language, this is Hebrew, um, which is slightly a little bit different, but still has the same connotation. Your word glory actually means to have or to hold a proper opinion. So when we say the glory of God, it means we're actually seeing God for who he really is. We understand God. You know, it's, it's not a brightness. Or, or a manifestation of light. Now, God dwells in light, so when you see him, you see light. And why does he dwell in light? What does light do? True light manifests everything for what it actually is. How do we actually see an atom? You ever thought about that? You know, nobody has actually ever seen an atom. What do you see? You see the shadow. And how do you see it? by exposing it under immense light. So God sees all things. But it's actually, when it's talking about glory, it's saying a proper opinion of who he is is above the heavens. He is one who's outside the heavens. He's not one of this creation. And then we come to omnipresent. Now, omnipresent oftentimes, by the way, is... Uh, some people will say that that's an attribute of God, but when you really understand omnipresence, that cannot be an attribute. Um, and we'll look at attributes too here shortly, because an attribute is something that the, the essence can naturally do. So omnipresence means what? You're present everywhere. 
before the creation of the universe, what was God present to? There was nothing to be present to, which means omnipresence is not an attribute. Omnipresence is a manifestation or belongs to his essence. Because his essence is so great and big, he can be present anywhere and everywhere at any time. Or again, another way of saying that is God is bigger than the universe. He's much bigger than the universe. So omnipresence is not an attribute of God. It said it describes the immensity of his essence. An attribute must be an ability of the essence that is true at all times. In an eternity past, there was nothing created for which God would be present to. Therefore, omnipresence is space-time relationship of immensity to creation. That's what actually omnipresence is. So it's a space-time relation. The universe was created within the essence of God. Since his essence is spirit, and spirit is not bound to material substance, it can exist in the same space without conflicting or causing confusion or of identity. So God is through all things, but all things are not God. So God's everywhere, you know. But, and, and some people will try to, to, they'll misinterpret this. You know, they'll say, you know, God is in nature, therefore nature is God. No. But yet God does exist in all things, but completely separate. And because he's spirit, and spirit is not bound by material substance, he can actually possess the same physical space as something that's physical without actually mixing up identities, without becoming that thing. That relates to his omnipresence. So let's see, God, God, create, God and creation are not one thing. His essence is present in all creation, yet at the same time, he transcends all creation. Since God's essence is beyond uh, cre the created being, each of the three members of the Godhead can be present to creation in different ways at various times. God the Father and God the Son are currently resident where? In the third heaven. Christ is not dwelling on earth at this point. Who is dwelling of the members of the Godhead who dwells on earth? The Holy Spirit dwells on earth. So you see that they can actually be or manifest their person in any area of the essence at any time. As a matter of fact, they can, they can even do it in multiple areas at the same time. You know, they're not bound uh, to one particular area. So God the Son, God the, the Holy, or God the Father, God the Son are in the third heaven. The Holy Spirit inhabits the, the earth here on, uh, on earth. During Christ's earthly ministry, God the Father and God the Spirit were present in the heavens. We see that in John chapter 14, verse 16, because it says, if I go away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Well, if he's sending him, that means he's not resident here. The ability to change location of residency reveals that each person of the Godhead totally possesses the entire divine nature and can therefore personalize or personally emphasize his presence in any place within the essence. So that has to do with the essence of God. So we need to understand God actually is spirit. And spirit is an actual real substance, but it's not bound to space and time. Spirit has within itself life. It is a, it's a per, it, it is self-existing. Now that is something that's interesting when it comes to humans, because one of our parts is is spirit, which by the way means that a a, a human never ceases to exist. Once we come into creation, we never cease to exist. Uh, because we're at one part of us is actually made of spirit. However, because of the we are created being, we do not possess life within ourselves. We do not have that possession where God actually does and his essence has that. A little bit different for humans. So 